Hey guys, in this video we're going to be looking at the physics part of global challenges for your OCR gateway. Now I'm going to take you through everything you need to know and to go with this to check off to make sure you've covered everything there is a free revision guide which you can download from my website. Stopping distance for a car is going to be made up of two things, thinking distance and braking distance. And you can see that the faster you're going, the more the stopping distance and the thinking distance increases. This is because for thinking distance, your brain needs to firstly see the image, the signal needs to get sent to your brain, needs to be processed and signal needs to get sent all the way down to your foot. And the faster you're going, the more distance you'll travel in the time that takes. Things that affect thinking distance are going to be drinking alcohol is negatively going to affect it, taking illegal drugs is negatively going to affect it, but taking something like caffeine is going to positively affect it. Um, tiredness is going to negatively affect it. Things that are going to affect braking distance are the conditions of the tyres. So nice new tyres are going to stop much quicker than old tyres which don't have much grip on the road. The condition of the road, so a snowy, icy road is going to have much longer braking distance than a new road, or a road that has a lot of um, grit on it is also going to have a long braking distance, and the weight of the car. A heavy, heavy car is going to take much longer to stop. The national grid is how we get um, electricity from power stations to our houses. The uh, power stations generate the electricity and they move it to a step up transformer. And then through a network of cables um, and pylons, this gets moved across the country to a step down transformer and then into our houses. Step up and step down transformers are an important part of our national grid. They work by uh, having a varying number of coils on each side, depending whether it's a step up or a step down transformer. A step up transformer will turn low voltage into a high voltage so that the um, uh, energy can move through a system, electricity can move through a system with less energy loss, making it more efficient. Whereas a step down transformer will take it from high voltage into a low voltage so it's safe to be in our homes. You need to know that voltage in the secondary coil times the current in the secondary coil is equal to voltage in the primary coil times the current in the primary coil. And our units for voltage are volts for current, amps, voltage, volts, currents, amps. When we're thinking about generating electricity, we can either do that with a renewable source or with a finite source. A renewable source is one that isn't going to run out and we can get more of it, whereas a finite source is going to run out. Renewable sources include things like the sun, the wind, water including tidal power, hydroelectric power, wave power, Geothermal power, whereas a finite resource is going to be a fossil fuel, so coal, oil, gas or nuclear power. The advantage of solar power, the advantage of the majority of renewable resources is that they don't release carbon dioxide. We're never going to run out of them and they're generally non-polluting. The disadvantage of solar is that it doesn't happen um, during night and isn't very good on cloudy days or wintry days. It can also be expensive to install. Wind turbines, a disadvantage of wind turbines is that some people don't like them. They also don't work very well on uh, non-windy days. Tidal and wave power can be disruptive to the local environment, whereas a hydroelectric dam involves um, flooding a large area, which may include people's homes or animals' habitats. And the disadvantage of geothermal power is that it can only be used in volcanic countries. The advantage of using fossil fuels or nuclear power is that they are very, very readily available. It's a very, very cheap source of electricity, and things like coal power stations have a very short start-up time. The disadvantage of using coal, oil and gas is that they take millions and millions of years to create, so we are about to run out of them. 
They are very, very heavily polluting, so they release large amounts of carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the atmosphere, which contribute to climate change. The disadvantage of nuclear power is that you have to store the nuclear radioactive waste for long periods of time, and there is a very small, but there is a potential risk of explosion. Mains electricity in the UK is 230 volts and 50 hertz. Inside a plug socket we have a fuse which has a very small bit of wire going through it. We can see from the circuit symbol for a fuse wire going all the way through. And this wire will melt if too much current goes through it, so that's a safety feature of the plug. We have the live wire, the earth wire, which is another safety feature of the plug, the neutral wire, the pins holding them down, the cable grip, another safety feature, making sure that um, the wire doesn't go anywhere, the cable, which is doubly encased in plastic, this is encased in plastic, then this is encased in plastic, again, another safety feature of the plug, and the plastic casing, another safety feature of the plug. When we are looking at stars, we can see light coming from them, and the wavelength of light can tell us things about them. If the wavelength has increased, the frequency has decreased, it means the wave is being stretched out, it's moving away from us. When the wavelength is increased, the light that's coming from these stars is going to look red. We can say this is red shifted. Sometimes the light coming from these stars might look a bit blue. When stars look a bit blue, it's because the wave is being squashed. It has a decreased wavelength and increased frequency. That means that the star is coming towards us. The majority of stars in the galaxy are moving away from us. You're going to get uh, maybe a dual system where one is moving away from us, one is moving towards us, so one might show red shift and one might show blue shift shift, but the majority are moving away from us. And because they are moving away from us, we can make the reverse assumption that at one point they were closer to us, really close to us, or that at one point they were in the same place as us. And this is how red shift gives evidence for the Big Bang. Here we have the life cycle of a star. It is going to start off as a cloud of dust and gas. And these are going to come together under the force of gravity. Because everything has gravity, no matter how small it is, um, no matter how large it is, it all has gravity. And then we're going to be a main sequence star. Our sun is actually a rather small star in comparison to most of the other stars in the galaxy, in the universe. Um, lots and lots of them are much, much bigger. Now, depending on the size of the star, they're going to undergo two different things. Our sun, being a rather small star, once um, the nuclear fusion that goes on in the centre has run out of fuel, it is going to become a red giant, and then it is going to cool down um, into a white dwarf or a black dwarf. If it is a large star, much, much more massive than our sun, it is going to become a red supergiant, it's going to undergo supernova, and then the dense, dense core of that is either going to turn into a black hole or a neutron star. Now, our sun is a second generation star. Because after this um, red supergiant undergoes supernova, what we are left with is a cloud of dust and gas. And that cloud of dust and gas can get together again to form a new star. And we know this is because the sun has heavy elements. Things like iron are present in the centre of the star. Which means, since we were created from this cloud of dust and gas, which also formed the earth, that you literally used to be a star. You are a star. You are made of stardust. You are a star. You can tell people that. Lots of different surfaces would emit and absorb radiation. Some will do it better than others. Over on the right hand side you can see the practical, one of the required practicals that I've done for you. Good absorbers are going to be dark surfaces and matte surfaces. 
good emitters are going to be dark matte surfaces. Good reflectors are going to be shiny surfaces. In the centre of a star, we have loads of hydrogen and helium. And they're going to be fusing together. This is nuclear fusion. Not fission that takes place in reactors that we have on Earth, but nuclear fusion. And we can see that massive amounts of energy is released. And this is energy as light and as heat energy. And if we were close enough, we'd be able to get the heat of sound energy as well. When all of the helium um, and hydrogen nuclei in the middle run out, that is when our star's um, life comes to an end. Now, our star, our sun, is a main sequence star, so it's going to have heavy elements as well. They are going to be undergoing the same process but the majority of um, elements inside a star inside the majority of stars in the universe are going to be hydrogen and helium. Everything emits infrared radiation and this is the balance between the amount of energy or the temperature the heat that is being absorbed and the amount that is being emitted at the same time. This can tell us a lot about the temperature of an object by looking at the wavelengths that are being emitted. Now a black body is an object in space which is going to perfectly absorb radiation. It does not emit it, it absorbs it. Our solar system is a beautiful, um, varied and fascinating thing. Starting with the Sun all the way over here, we move through Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars and our moons. The asteroid belts with some dwarf planets in, I'll come back to those in a second. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and poor old Pluto down here, which isn't a planet anymore. It's just a dwarf planet. To help you remember the order, we have my very easy method just speeds up naming and then it used to be planets at the end but Pluto isn't a planet anymore so it's now my very easy method just speeds up naming. If you guys have any other um, ways that you remember the order of the planets or anything else pop that in the comments below because I'm sure loads of other people would love to see what you come up with. So poor old Pluto here it used to be a planet, it is now a dwarf planet. Um, I'll do a separate video on why Pluto is now a dwarf planet but our dwarf planets are here, here here and here. I'm not going to try and pronounce some of those names because I'm very, very sure I will get it wrong. Um, we have an asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter um, and then another belt of large objects right on the edge. People used to believe that all the planets revolved around the Earth but now we have moved to a heliocentric system and we know that all the planets revolve around the Sun. The value of gravity depends on where you are. The value of gravity on Earth is 10 newtons per kilogram. Where on the Moon, the value of gravity is much less, which is why it looks like they're bouncing around on the Moon. However, if you are falling on Earth, we can say that your acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second squared. Same number, different units. The reason that gravity is so much less on the moon because the moon is much less massive. It has less mass. The galaxy that we live in is the Milky Way. And here you can see the Milky Way stretching across the sky. We are on the edge of the Milky Way on one of the arms right on the outside. In the middle is a black hole.
An artificial satellite is going to be something that we've put up into space to orbit the Earth, whereas a natural satellite is going to be something like the Moon, which naturally orbits the Earth. A satellite is just anything that orbits the Earth. They maintain their orbit around the Earth due to gravity. There is a key distinction between the terms speed and velocity. Speed is how fast you are going. Velocity is how fast you are going in a certain direction. So speed is going to be a scalar quantity and velocity is going to be a vector quantity. If something is going in a circle, for example, orbiting the planet, it can be going at a constant speed, but it is not going in the same direction. If it is going in the same direction, it would always be going like that, in straight lines. So it is constantly changing direction, which is why you can have a change in velocity while going at the same speed. When an earthquake occurs, we can use the resulting waves to give us information about the structure of the Earth's Earth. P waves are primary waves. They are longitudinal. They can travel through solids and liquids, which means they can travel all the way through the Earth. So if an earthquake happens over here, the P waves are going to go all the way through, including through the solid core. S waves are secondary waves. They are transverse waves. and they can only go through solids. So they can't go through liquids. And because of these two different types of waves and how they're detected on the opposite side of the Earth, um, this tells us information about the structure of the Earth.